section two of Of Mice and Men Revision, Okie Cokies. So Steinbeck starts as he always does with cinematic techniques for the first main paragraph. Now this is a description of the bunkhouse. That is where the ranch men would sleep and interact when not working on the ranch. Several things to mention here. I've underlined the two word little articles, which means a few things, because it reflects the fact that the ranch men, the ranch workers, do not own very much. This is where you could reference 1930s America. The Great Depression had happened because of the Wall Street crash, and therefore things that were owned and money were few and far between. I've also underlined littered with playing cards because it represents and reflects the boredom of the everyday life on the ranch. Everything was the same day in, day out. And so they are trying to entertain themselves, but it reflects their kind of um, simple way of life that they might not choose for themselves, but it is a necessity. At the bottom of page 19, which is where section two begins, there is a description of George and Lenny in the third paragraph. Obviously, this is very much a repeat of section one, where we've heard about George and Lenny and Steinbeck's descriptions, and also shows the parent and child relationship that George and Lenny have. Oh, hello. Page 20. So the first character that George and Lenny meet is Candy. His age is emphasised by the old man and the old swamper. That's important because as we get into section three and four, it is obvious that Candy wants to feel useful and that is why he offers financial security to the focal dream because as he is getting older he knows that he is more and more useless and he is afraid of quote getting canned c-a-n-n-e-d there's also a description of candy round stick like wrist now if you ever have to mention or want to mention the fact that candy has lost his hand maybe because you're discussing the fact that he wants to feel useful and that's why he offers financial security to george and lenny to be a part of the focal dream it can be quite a difficult one to describe in your own words. It can come across as being either quite basic or quite offensive. So if you can take quotations such as round stick like wrist but no hand, then you're actually embedding quotations. Even if the extract isn't on this page, you can embed this quotation and it does the description for you. So you get points for writing it in a mature way, but you also get marks for embedding quotations so it's always useful to write these things down and my group you know I've asked you to go through the novels and the play to go through and start listing some of the quotations you know you're going to, to need no matter what the extract or the question so moving to page 21 Steinbeck does a lot of describing of the bunkhouse and this particular moment is where George is questioning why the man before them decided to, quote, quit. Um, and it says, suggests a sense of danger and perhaps a sense of unease, which you could perhaps link to a cataphoric reference or foreshadowing later in the novel. Again, Steinbeck describes the things that George owns. And it's fairly standard for a ranch worker at this time. And then we have the introduction of crooks being discussed. Notice the use of this word here. Remembering it gives context to 1930s America. It shows the segregation at this time. Segregation means that the men who were considered to be white 
were in the bunkhouse and crooks because he was a different colour. He was separated from them, different set of rules applied to him and that's why I've got status and hierarchy below. He would have been the bottom of the pile in terms of hierarchy with the boss at the top, then Curly as the boss's son, then the ranch workers, then Curly's wife and then Crooks. So he is really the bottom of the pile in terms of hierarchy. Page 22 in the brown book. Again, we have more discussion of Crooks. It gives you plenty of opportunity to mention 1930s America. It shows that the boss, when the boss is angry, he takes that frustration out on Crooks because he is a more vulnerable person that he is able to yell out or, quote, give him hell. It's interesting that's mentioned but because, of course, George does the same to Lenny. Um, maybe because Lenny is vulnerable when George gets frustrated. The difference is George genuinely cares about Lenny, but it might work as a discussion point depending on the question that you get. Again, we have 1930s segregation, and this is the description of when they allowed crooks to come into the bunkhouse and to fight somebody in one of the ranch workers. And that shows that they're just using him for entertainment. So again, that hierarchy, that status is shown. Even though the ranch men who work on the ranch don't have a particularly high status, they are certainly considered um, above crooks. So worth mentioning because it's good to get your 1930s reference in there. Jumping to page 26, mainly because last year, for the OCR English literature question and extract, they were discussing the moment where the boss entered the ranch for the first time, the, sorry, the bunkhouse for the first time. So I'm not going through it because it is unlikely that will come up again. If it does, you can complain at me. Okay, so what we're starting with is um, looking at the unique friendship of George and Lenny. Now this is where the boss has come in to meet them. Obviously he's angry at the fact they were not there the night before and to cover up the fact that George and Lenny travel together because remember that was very unique and unusual at this time in America, George says that they are related. Once the boss has left, Lenny begins to question this. So he says, you said I was your cousin, George. And that kind of shows that unique relationship that men didn't travel together, men didn't look out for each other. It was sort of every man for himself. And that makes George and Lenny's relationship very unique in 1930s America. Then they've got a bit of sense of humour coming up. Um, and George says, if I was a relative of yours, I'd shoot myself. Now he's obviously being sarcastic at this point, but it does sort of lighten the mood from where the boss has come in and... Um, sort of reprimanded George and Lenny and questioned them. At the bottom of page 26, we have an example of sort of typical ranch life. A guy on a ranch don't never listen, nor he don't ask no questions. It sort of shows that they just simply get on with their life. Um, and that sort of shows that idea that they are insignificant. They're one of many ranch workers. I've missed out this little bit in the middle. Good to point out, again, um, it's the kind of thing you might want to take down as a quotation because if you might, if you're thinking you're going to um, use anything about the dog at any point, you might want some quotations to back that up, even if it's not this extract. So of course we have the first mention of the dog old eyes. I've circled old because there's a connection there between calling the dog old but also calling his owner Candy old and of course there is a connection when the dog is shot because he is useless and of no use anymore and simply is just Candy's companion. Therefore someone like Carlson feels there is no need for the dog to be in the bunkhouse with them. He's completely disposable. That gives a connection to the way Candy feels about his the things that he does in the ranch and how he'll eventually be disposable too. It's also a cataphoric reference to what will happen to the dog. 
So we move to page 27. We have the introduction of Curly. Obviously a head of tightly curled hair suggests his name, which we're assuming is a nickname. And like the boss, he wore high heeled boots. It reflects his status, but also hints or infers that Curly is quite short and therefore needs to wear heeled boots. It gives a description of Curly's personality. Steinbeck uses the word coldly to show that he's an unfriendly person. Connotations of coldly include being mean, being unkind, unwelcoming. So it gives a suggestion of what type of personality Curly is. And of course, going through right into section six, we know that Curly too is a unpleasant, aggressive man. Also, his glance was at once calculating and pugnacious. It shows that he is not only unpleasant, but he's almost trying to decipher what George and Lenny are like. And of course, he's somebody who enjoys targeting the vulnerable, and Lenny is certainly that. Even though he's tall and strong and big, Lenny is a vulnerable character, and that suggests Curly's calculating personality whilst he deciphers that. Page 28. Again, it starts with Curly picking on the vulnerable. Look how I've spelt vulnerable there, it has an L in it. Sometimes people misspell that, um, and it's quite a, a sort of a, a word that can be used in poetry. I know we certainly use it with Gillian Clark, and in time we're talking about childhood memories. Certainly with Lenny here, um, and there have been other moments where, I think in the language exam, people have tried to write vulnerable, and often the L is missed out. So please learn that. Let the big guy talk is something that Curly says, and again, it's showing that he enjoys picking on the vulnerable. He's also almost um, offended by Lenny because Lenny is everything he's not. He's tall, he's broad, he's strong, and Curly, unfortunately, is not those things. Again, the unique friendship and travelling together is mentioned when George says, we travel together, and, and Curly says, oh, so it's that way. It shows that unique um, idea for 1930s America. This bit's interesting because we go on to describe Slim in the next few pages, and Curly doesn't earn respect, he demands it. And it's a real contrast to the way the men, and certainly the way Steinbeck describes Slim. He doesn't earn it, he demands it. When he leaves, Candy describes Curly, and he describes him as pretty handy, meaning he likes to punch. That is a cataphoric reference to section three. It also introduces the theme of violence, which we have throughout this novel. If you think in section one with the death of the mouse, that can be connected to the theme of violence. And now we have this suggestion that someone on the ranch is violent as well. And of course it goes on through the sections. Moving to page 29. At the top, we have another cataphoric reference about Curly. This is suggesting that he hates big guys because, again, Lenny and anyone who is broad and tall is everything that he is not, and therefore he needs to prove himself, or he feels like he needs to prove himself. There's a repetition here with Curly's pretty handy. This emphasises the theme of violence and also intensifies that cataphoric reference. However, another cataphoric reference to the end of section three, but also the end of section five, is when George says, but Lenny's strong and quick. It shows that Lenny has strength that perhaps he doesn't even realise he has. Curly is discussed a bit further. This is by The Old Man, which is, of course, Candy. Again, that repetition of old suggests that he is almost worthless on the ranch. 
and it suggests the status and power that Curly has because he is the boss's son. It establishes why Curly's wife dislikes him in section 4 because he is this unpleasant, violent young man. Remember with Curly's wife we need the apostrophe. Um, quite often that's missed out there and it does need to be in there. The examiner will be more impressed if you put the apostrophe in. Moving to page 30. There we go, page 30. So this is the grotesque imagery that Steinbeck describes or creates rather when discussing Curly and it's almost as if the swamper who is Candy is gossiping about someone they don't like which is Curly and they're talking about his glove full of Vaseline which is fairly grotesque it's apparently to keep his hands soft for his wife ew that is gross so it is deliberate to create this grotesque image and I'm questioning here that actually I think Steinbeck is doing this to make him deliberately unappealing. Immediately, as a reader, we are disgusted by Curly, not only by his personality, but by this piece of knowledge that we have from Candy, who is gossiping with George and Lenny. At the bottom of page 30, Curly's wife is mentioned, and it is established that she is pretty, as in pretty, but she got the eye, meaning she's looking at other men. Now that's important because it is a misconception, a misconception that Curly's wife is flirtatious. Because as you know, in section five, when she's talking to Lenny, she admits that she simply is lonely and loneliness is a theme that runs throughout the novel and actually she's only looking for friendship and someone to talk to, someone to interact with, which she's certainly not getting from Curly. As we move on to page 31, ranch life is discussed. The fact that Curly's wife is called a tart is something that I would make sure I've noted down because it is something that you can use as an embedded quotation no matter what extract you get, if you need to discuss Curly's wife. And it's Candy that says that if you want to reference that in any essay or extract question. At the bottom of page 31, it shows the frustration on the ranch and it shows sort of a lack of respect, especially towards crooks. And it so shows, excuse me, the treatment of ranch workers, which wasn't particularly nice, as we're getting. Page 32, we have a cataphoric reference. And this is where George is talking to Lenny and basically saying, you know, stay out of the way of Curly because he's not a nice guy. Um, and this shows that idea that Curly really enjoys picking on the vulnerable, targeting the vulnerable. He figures he got you scared and he's going to take a sock at you the first chance he gets. And of course, that is a cataphoric reference to the next section, but also really showcases Curly's personality. So on page 33, the dream is discussed. And this is a way that George can almost control Lenny's behaviour in a certain way. He says, if I get in any trouble, you ain't going to let me tend the rabbits. And it's almost using the dream as a bargaining tool for Lenny's behaviour, which shows his childlike quality again. On page 34, we have the full introduction of Curly's wife. Now, if Curly's wife is mentioned, it is important to make references to section 5 where possible. You know you need to reference elsewhere in the novel, that is something you're very used to. There is description here, so where there are descriptions, we know that we're looking for writing techniques and connotations of words. Here's one, she had full rouge lips, we have connotations of rouge, red, passionate, flirtatious, love, anger, 
danger, all the things that you could connect to the way Curly's wife is portrayed, but then also the danger from section five. Red is mentioned several times and the inference, Steinbeck is suggesting that she is a, quote, tart. However, once referencing section five, the region knows this is not the case. We have a really cute simile, and don't write cute simile in your essay, I'm just saying it's cute, talking about her hair hung in little rolled clusters like sausages. Shows that she's very particular, she really takes care of the way she looks, which is also emphasised by heavily made up. Now, of course, this perhaps is suggesting that tart like quality, but Steinbeck makes it clear in section five that in fact it is her physically portraying her dream, which is a theme, dreaming and dreams, of being an actress. Her voice had a nasal, brittle quality. Again, connotations of brittle, um, easily broken, almost like very sharp, nasal and perhaps irritating, very sort of um, uh, almost quite high pitched. It perhaps suggests the way the men feel about Curly's wife. Moving on to page 35. This is where Slim comes in and sees Curly's wife and she's trying to find Curly according to her and he says well you're not trying very hard and it sort of shows the theme of loneliness and isolation. George looked around at Lenny. Jesus, what a tramp. That is George's first reaction and kind of gives a sense of how he feels about Curly's wife. Tramp is something you could also embed if you're writing um, something about Curly's wife. Now, Lenny's reaction is quite different, a real contrast to George because he doesn't understand the adult world and what things perhaps mean. He only looks at what he sees and, and works on instinct, which is why Steinbeck describes him in an animalistic way. But he thinks that she is pretty, meaning she's pretty. Cataphoric reference to section five, of course, um, but he's, he's having quite a different reaction to George. And that is why George reprimands him about interacting with Curly's wife. Page 36. It's showing Lenny's struggles in an adult world. He doesn't like this place. He's worried about Curly. George has just told him off about interacting with Curly's wife. He wants to get out of here, to quote him. He doesn't feel safe, which is an ongoing struggle for um, Lenny. We also, on the bottom of page 36, we also have the description of Slim. The Prince of the Ranch, capable of driving 10, 16, even 20 mules. Steinbeck creates this godlike, which is a quotation you can use, godlike, description of Slim. Unlike Curly, who demands respect, Slim is the utter contrast and earns it by his kindness, by his tolerance and the way he looks out for the men on the ranch. It shows that he's talented by this description. And it shows that he is very sort of pleasant to not only talk to, but he considers other people. Now, remembering that it was 1930s America, every man for himself. And so that kind of personality with somebody looking out for other people was unique. And the way George is for Lenny, by the end of this novel, Slim is for George, providing that protection, providing that comfort. And you can see that by the very end page of section six. If you wanted to embed certain quotations about Slim, the use of the word kindly is a good one to show that sort of pleasant nature that he has. So moving to page 38. This is where George is describing Lenny. Um, and this is the first time we've seen anyone sort of do that, well George do that, 
And it's quite interesting to see George's perspective on Lenny when talking to another adult rather than just talking to Lenny. And he mentions he ain't bright. Obviously, Steinbeck has already established that Lenny struggles to function in an adult world. Hell of a good worker, though. Hell of a nice fella, but he ain't bright. So it shows that he's strong and it shows that he struggles, but he has a good heart. And it also shows that unique connection that they have. We also have an introduction of Carlson. Carlson is the man who eventually shoots Curly's, not Curly's dog, Candy's dog. That'd be changing the story a bit, wouldn't it? A powerful big stomach man came into the bunkhouse. It's important that he's described in this way because it does show that he dominates other members of the ranch. And certainly that's what he does with Candy when persuading him that his dog needs to be put down. We've got a cataphoric reference on page 39. The cataphoric reference is about the pups. Slim's dog has had pups. And of course, this is something that Lenny would love. George has already mentioned it when he's killed the mouse in section one, that the puppy would, a puppy would be better for Lenny because he's probably unlikely to kill it. Ironic, because in section five, that's exactly what he does. So it's a cataphoric reference to section five. And then we have another cataphoric reference, which is about Candy shooting his old dog. Um, and it suggests that he is useless as a dog and he shouldn't be in the ranch and on the ranch. And that's very similar to how Candy feels later on in the novel. Almost there, I promise. And you can have a break. Go and get yourself a brownie or something to treat yourself. Not that I am promoting emotional eating guys but you know revision is better with a snack so page 40 it shows Lenny's childlike quality when he's heard about the puppies he gets so overexcited and decides the color immediately and the fact that he says excitedly well Steinbeck says excitedly shows that childlike quality the end of this re-establishes the tension that we felt at the beginning of this section Curly comes back in and he's looking for his wife and it just re-establishes the unpleasant personality that Curly has and almost suggests that Curly will be trouble to George and Lenny. On page 41, Steinbeck finishes with cinematic techniques and that includes a cataphoric reference to the demise of Candy's dog. Okay, kiddies, go and have a break. You deserve it. I'm going to have a break too. Whew.